from Peninsula Health in, in Victoria, that's centred around Frankston, recognised really as one of the premier uh, health services in Victoria, regularly wins awards, um, advanced thinking, it's an outer metropolitan service which has a lot of the issues of outer metropolitan services, although it does border on a rather um, silver, silver tail, tail area on the Mornington Peninsula. Please welcome Jan. Norman's pinched my thunder about our patch, so I'll just summarise it again quickly. Um, we're in a beautiful part of Victoria, down the end, uh, near the sea, surrounded by water three ways. We have Sorrento and the beautiful parts of Mornington and Mount Martha where, you know, Lindsay Fox and all of those rich people, Kylie, have their holiday homes and come and visit us. We also have one of the highest amphetamine uses um, in Frankston. We have and some of the lowest, <laughs> some of the lowest um, socioeconomic factors that uh, influence healthcare. It's a very mixed community. It grows by about 100,000 every year, and that's the holiday makers on the Rosebud foreshore. So, we we are a, a diverse community. What makes it good about our community is that we play nicely together because we're surrounded by water three ways. So all of the players, all of the parts of the patch actually work pretty well together. So I'm gonna take you on a bit of a journey about Peninsula Health and its journey on community participation. And I'm gonna start off by saying that there's no one size fits all around this gig. There's no one right way to do this. And if any of you have come here today thinking you're gonna pick up a book and that's gonna be the magic answer and you'll be able to implement, then you need to rethink, because you need to think about what it is you need to do for your local community, you need to understand that local community, and you need to apply a whole lot of different things to engage and understand what um, your consumers and who they are. So, this is the uh, strategic direction, doing it with us, not for us, and it's been mentioned a couple of times today, and I have to say it's one of the best policies that's come out of the Department of Health, um, Human Services, DHS, whichever name it goes under. It actually talks about people being meaningfully involved, and it talks about that all the way through the policy. And really, you could read it and you could say, well, community participation is really about being involved in just about anything and everything. It's an open door. It should be part of your day-to-day -day work, part of what you embed into your day-to-day -day processes. It's not an add-on. It's just about how you do business. It talks about who consumers are, and you, know, you could read um, millions of pieces of literature about defining that, and we had a little bit of a go at that before. It just says that consumers could be anybody. It says that consumers and consumer participation is a democratic right, and I think that's a really important thing for us to consider in how we think through how we facilitate participation. And it talks about seeing things through the consumer lens particularly for marginalised groups. So it describes that participation is a way that health professionals, clinicians, managers, suits, actually get to understand what it means to be a consumer of a health service, whatever that service is. What I really like about the policy is how it talks about the types of participation. So this is a bit talked about um, in the previous session and in the literature, there is a strong mm, undercurrent of a ladder that describes levels of participation and that if you're down the bottom of that ladder, then you're pretty tokenistic about participation. You're doing it and it's great that you're doing it, but it's a bit tokenistic and that really, until you get up the ladder to the levels of control and delegation, you're really not in the zone of truly engaging consumers in what it is that happens in your world, whatever your world is. So I find this a really useful thing to measure against. And we were talking about metrics before. I think this is one of the best metrics in a policy framework that I've seen because it actually allows you to look through the lens and see what it is that you're doing and where you are in those layers of participation, those types of participation, and gets you to think about how well you're going in that, in that zone. 
policy also talks about levels of participation in terms of individual program service and DH. And this is another good way for you to think through how you might construct participation or understand how participation is working in your zone. Individual participation is about you as a clinician working with a consumer and, and actually making sure that they are absolute partners in whatever decisions are happening to their individual health care. It, it, it actually makes sure that we're not doing things to people, but that we're working together to work out what their health care is. Program and service level is really important because it helps you understand what you're doing with each of your areas or departments or uh, within each of your constructs that you have, organisational constructs. But it actually also says that at the service level, at the whole of service level, you need to have constructs in place and frameworks in place to facilitate participation. And these things are all spelled out in different ways throughout the policy. The other thing to say about community participation in Victoria is that community advisory committees are mandated, they're legislated. So every public health service, major public health service, was required some years ago to form a community advisory committee. And all of us have done that a little bit differently and some of them still work pretty well and get the job done, but they are a bit of a tick box and I agree with Jason about that. And some of them have gone a little bit further and the Department of Health have pushed us pushed health services to make sure that we're not just ticking the boxes. And part of that is these guidelines and also a set of policies that have been out in the last 12 months around measuring the metrics of your participation. We've just had a new government um, who, are, who have released a new metropolitan health plan, a new priorities framework document. And what's good about that is that community participation has strong policy endorsement within that. Now, the devil's still in the detail, and we still have to work some of that through. But in fact, the policy talks about, as one of its seven goals, to improve every Victorian's health status and experiences. And the experiences stuff gets quite a bit of measure in the policy documents and in the rhetoric that's flowed since. And part of that experience stuff is about taking consumer engagement and consumer participation to a different level, into a new zone, where we don't just, as people said before, measure satisfaction, but we actually start to think about experience and transition between services and those sorts of things. And it really lends itself nicely to start to think about how that might, what that might mean for Medicare locals. I guess the other thing I wanted to say about you know, the whole community participation jargon is that over the last five years, I think, there's been a shift in some of the, the dialogue and that dialogue has been about patient-centred care or consumer-centred care or, you know, family-centred care. There's, there's a hundred li little titles that have been given to this shift. But it actually says it's not just about engaging consumers or having them involved in whatever part of your being that you're doing, it's actually about measuring what their experience is and what their outcome is. It has a greater focus on us actually thinking about what is important for patients or consumers and how we can really understand the impact that our service delivery system has on them and what we can do to improve that. In the literature, there are lots of good consistent themes about what are the consistent facilitators of patient-centred care. And I'll come back to some of these, but I guess I put that slide in because what's really important is that those things are the essence of building relationships and of how we might design Medicare local partnerships, in my view. So, let me tell you about how we do community participation, engagement, patient-centred care at Peninsula Health. At the start, there was very strong leadership and a leap of faith. And I have to say that about five years ago, the board, who was a very committed and very community-focused board, had a very strong vision for how it should be. We see that we're a community. We're a bit like Barwon. We actually see that we're part of the community. And we saw that 
our role as healthcare providers needed to be um, embedded in that community. So we actually didn't know how we were going to do this, but we said, well, let's have a go. And this is sort of where we're at. Nice little framework for you, Jace. Um, and I'll take you through them because they are important. The first one up the top is the community participation plan. And that's actually a plan that is submitted to the Department of Health annually. And it has within it what we as a health service are doing to engage people in their care. Not what the consumers are doing, but what we're doing. What do we need to do to make sure that we improve the patient's experience? We have a team of people who help drive some of this. So there's three EFT of staff who drive this. And one of the common questions we get asked is, well, how did you resource that? Well, I'll tell you how I resource that. I took away clinicians. I'm the director of nursing and I actually said we're going to do with less of the other to make sure we've got resource to do this. Because you can't do this without having somebody driving this. But I also have to say that the real community participation team at Peninsula Health is probably about two or three hundred staff who drive processes as part of their day-to-day -day business. And those three people there are really resources now to support the consumers in the organisation. So it's a very important shift that's happened over the years to make sure that that team that started off doing the doing is now supporting consumers and that the staff on the floor are doing the doing. We have a set of KPIs that are reported to the board every month. We have a person-centred care program, which is pretty much in its infancy, I have to say, because person-centred care is you know, a long journey and we're right at the start of that, I think. But it is about saying that in five years' time, patients who go through our system, not just our service, but our system, should experience better things than what they're experiencing now. The CAGs and CACs I'll come back to, and the volunteers I'll probably come back to, but just to say, we have 900 volunteers at Peninsula Health. Those 900 volunteers every day make a difference to how we think about things, how we see things, because they make us accountable for what it is that they think as consumers should be happening. This is our governance structure, and it, what's important about this is a couple of things. It reports up to the Board of Management. So the Consumer Advisory Committee and my role reports directly to the board about how we go about community participation. And it's supported by teams, it's supported by PR, HR, quality services, and through some structural committees. And those committees have existed now for years. This is probably the best foundation that we have for community participation, though, in Peninsula Health. And it's complex, so let me take you through it. We have a community advisory committee that's mandated. It's got a consumer chair. Uh, I support that committee. Our CEO is on that committee. We have two board directors on that committee. But it's essentially run by the consumers and those consumers have a three-year election period. Those consumers, one of each of those on the community advisory committee, sits on one of those 14 groups underneath. So those 14 community advisory groups represent the diversity of our community, and not in total by any means. But I was saying to somebody before that the folk in Rosebud, they know they're different to the folk in Western Port, who absolutely know they're different to the folk in um, Frankston. So they all want to be represented by themselves. They all want their own voice, and so they have their own group. Then we have groups that support our IV drug users, the Sharps group. So they all work a little bit differently. Um, some of these are very formal, like the Frankston group's very formal. They have agendas, they have minutes. The IV drug users, the Sharps group, they don't have minutes, they don't do police checks, we don't do any of that sort of stuff with them. And they sit around at a venue, usually a cafe, to be decided, and they'll talk about how, how they want to influence whatever we do around needle exchange, around sharps, around HIV, all of those issues. The youth CAG is exactly the way Jason described it. You know, we use headspace, we use skate parks. We'd never have a meeting. We would never please check our young people. Um, and we make sure that we meet when they want to meet. 
So it could be any time. The gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, intersex CAG is probably our strongest CAG at the moment. It has 50 members who turn up every time. Um, and they turn up because they don't like the way that we actually manage transgender patients in Peninsula Health, in Frankston Health for Hospital. And so they've drawn the policy up. They've rewritten how we're going to do this business. And we've said to them, well, hang on, you know, if I'm a woman and I'm sitting in that bed, I'm going to feel uncomfortable. And we've had those conversations. And those conversations happen as part of the process of them feeding into our processes about what we should and shouldn't do. And I guess the other example I wanted to raise is our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander group. We have one of the, we have, we're a very waspish community, very Anglo-Saxon community, but we have three or four disparate um, groups of Aboriginals within our community. And the thing that's worked for us over the years now is that we run a Koori community kitchen. We get 50 people to our Koori kitchen every month and we yarn. We actually just sit and yarn. Again, no minutes, there's no process, there's no formality, but they tell us what sucks and they tell us what's good and they tell us what to fix and we hear what we need to do and we change that. And the biggest deliverable with all of this is that if they tell us something, then we've got to be accountable for doing something about it or for saying why we're not. This is our community participation plan and um, there are projects, there are something like 48 projects specifically done around community participation and these are all measured and monitored through the community participation plan. And consumer representation on committees is an important but not the only way that we actually make sure that we engage consumers. And as everybody here has today said, engagement of consumers on committees is just one way and it's tricky. You can't put one consumer onto a committee with seven board members and five clinicians who are all at each other. You actually need to figure out a process around that. But we've grown now that we've got 127 consumer roles on committees at the end of last year, where we started off five years ago with none. And we've now got consumers doing RCAs, which is our root cause analysis, and involved in those sort of processes that we might never have done before. And the reason that this has happened, I think, is because of leadership. The board absolutely said, we're going to do this, and we're going to do it right, and we're going to do it as best we can, and we're going to listen to the community about what they want, and we're going to develop something that meets their needs. So the board said, do it, and the board said, an executive needs to lead that, that's me, and then all of these other structural things were put into place to make it happen. So when we were talking about a Medicare local, we were thinking about how will we actually facilitate participation in that local. We're in the second tranche, we've got a submission in, we don't know what the outcome of that is. But I guess the thing that we said more than ever is that these are our partners, these are the people, the players in our, um, in our patch. And what we said is we mustn't re reinvent the wheel and we must build on stuff. So in Victoria, we have primary care population health committees and we have a very functional primary care population health committee. And this committee, comprising those people, has been doing a lot of work over a number of years, and I'll tell you a little bit about that, that will put us in good stead for the future. So the first thing that we said in developing our submission was we actually have to understand our community. We have to understand what they expect from us. What are they accessing and what are they not accessing? And the not accessing is, is, as somebody else said before, more important than what they are accessing. What's our burden of disease? What are the consumer relationships and bodies that already exist? Um, what is it that's out there? Understanding all of that was really, really critical for us in trying to think through how we might facilitate and morph that into the Medicare local. And the important thing that some people had to go on a journey about is that explicit understanding that community participation is a strategy. It's not just a representative and it's not just having a few people here and there. You actually have to have a plan. It has to be part of what you do every day. And there were some people who think that community participation is just still feedback and we have to educate them. 
So there's a lot of data around about what consumers like. Um, I picked this because it was New South Wales, close to Canberra. Um, we've got our own data in Peninsula. One of the things that we did through our um, collaborations locally was we actually went through some client journeys and mapped client journeys and said, what, what do you feel? What, what, what happens to you when you go through the system? Not just at Peninsula Health, but when we transfer you back to your GP or to local government or all of that. And this is a... It's a report that sort of makes you want to have a glass of wine at night because you worry about how the system is for consumers. This is our Bible, and I really loved the data stuff before, and I'm happy to show somebody this, and it's available on our intranet. But this is our primary care planning document, and this has been developed from all of our partners over the past three years, and we've just updated it again. And it's one common document for the catchment about all of those things that were talked about before, about the self-determinants, about social determinants, about what is our geography um, saying about our burden of disease, all of that is here. And this really important document is owned by all of our players and is written in plain language so that even me, a nurse, can actually understand data. It says some great stuff about what our health inequalities are, and you'll see that it actually picks it out from both the Frankston catchment and the Mornington Peninsula catchment, the two LGAs that are in our catchment. What's really important about that is that it means that our strategy for engagement and our strategy for our population health plan has to be different. So we've had to get down into the level of detail that helps us understand what the real needs are in each catchment. Diabetes has been talked about before. Well, for us, it's one of our top 10. It is in the top 10 ambulatory sensitive conditions. For those of you who don't know, that means that these people shouldn't be going into our hospital beds, but they are. They're actually sitting in beds that shouldn't be. They should be treated outside, and yet it's top of the pops for our catchment. And differently, depending on the age and depending on the LGA. So if you look at Mornington, um, it's top up there. Frankston, it's top up there, but you go down to population rates, you go down to bed days, all of that data is really important in determining what it is that you're going to do about your strategy. And if you break all of that down into age groups, you'll see that, well, diabetes might be up there if you're getting older, and, and we know that we've got one of the most ageing populations in the catchment um, in Victoria, but it's actually not top of the pops if you're, you know, under 20. And so, again, our strategy about how we deal with population health and how we respond to our community needs and understand them has to be different based on the data. This is some work on socioeconomic disadvantage, stuff around risk factors for males, stuff for females. The point is that all of that data and all of those points of information that come to us via our community advisory groups, via the meetings, via all of those structures, what we have to do in the Medicare local zone is to put those pieces together. That's the challenge, I think, for us. And it isn't a one-size-fits-all. We, in our catchment, will build on the work that we've done, but it's not going to fix everything or understand everything. It will help paint a picture that will help put the jigsaw partly together. So I just wanted to say that the key success factors that we think for our CP processes and that we will try and engender in our, in our Medicare local when it's funded, I'm being positive, is really the first key thing is to know your community. You actually have to understand who it is that you're working with and really understand them well. Not just from the data, but you have to sit down and talk to them and you have to be able to communicate and, and hear what it is that they want to say and what are their issues. That transparent communication, I can't tell you how important that is. And for the last five, six, seven years, when we have invested time and time again in listening to consumers, in validating back what they've said, in fixing the things that they've identified, it's gold. And if you don't do that, if you don't build relationships where they trust you, and if you don't invest the time to listen and understand, you will never succeed, is my view. You will never succeed. And you will be tokenistic. So that trust, that communication is really, really important. 
Understanding that one size won't fit, one size fits all won't work is really important. And at the end of the day, the thing that you have to go back to is what does the consumer want? Because there'll be bun fights between organisations and there'll be argy-bargy about data. And the one thing that we've always focused on is what does the consumer at the end of the day want? And if you've got enough consumers who can give you enough voices in enough different ways, then you will be able to find your way through the fog and, and find some way to actually truly and meaningfully engage with the consumer. So that's our experience and I'm happy to talk to you about it anymore.